Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you guys for coming to Black History is Church History. As was already stated, my name is Anthony English, and I am very excited to be here this afternoon with all of you. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll, uh, we'll dive right in. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, your Son. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will be glorified first and foremost, that Jesus, you would be exalted, and Holy Spirit, that you would do the work that only you can do. Edify and build up your people. And if there's anyone here today who does not yet know you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, would today be a day that they take a step closer to you? May today be the day of salvation for some. So forgive us for all of our sins, Lord, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, This afternoon's message is titled, Go Tell It on the Mountain, Black People and Global Missions. Uh, Before we begin, I want to thank Pastor Way, I want to thank Pastor B, um, and just thank Worthy Redeemer for the invitation to come out here to Huntsville today. Uh, Like I said, I'm excited, and uh, I I pray that this is a blessing for y'all. Our time today is going to be broken up into four different sections. The first section is too brief missionary stories, Uh, a story about a African-American female missionary, then an African-American male missionary. And then the second part is going to be answering the question, why are black missionaries so important? The third will be to answer the question, if black missionaries are so important, why do we have so few black missionaries on the field today? And then lastly, we will address what are some of the steps that we can take both individually, as families, and as a church, to see more black missionaries on the field. So uh, and with these stories, these missionary stories, they're going to be brief. Don't have the time to go in depth, but I hope that this is like an appetizer for y'all and that you get so interested in these stories that you would check out their stories and the stories of other African-American missionaries. So first up, we have Miss Maria Fearing, and I think there is a uh, picture of her here. There we go, Miss Maria Fearing, who was born in 1838 to Jesse and Mary Fearing, both of them slaves on a plantation owned by Overton Wilson in Gainesville, Sumter County. When she reached young adulthood, Fearing was chosen to be a house servant by the plantation owner's wife. Amanda Winston. Winston was a Presbyterian and taught Fearing to read the Bible. Give me a second. I'm going to put these on the ground real quick. There we go. All right, let's continue. So Winston was a Presbyterian and taught Fearing to read the Bible and told her tales of missionaries in Africa. She encouraged Fearing to join the Presbyterian church, which Maria Fearing soon did. Years later, she hears this talk from a Presbyterian missionary to Africa named William Henry Shepard, and remembering the tales of the missionaries that she uh, uh, was told by Amanda Winston, she volunteered at the age of 56 to become a missionary in the Congo in Central Asia. So for those who say, I feel like I'm too old to engage in missions, that's not true. 56, almost 60, and God uses her mightily on the field. So after her arrival in the Congo, she immediately learns the language and later begins to teach a Sunday school class. After a year there, she's given an official position by the uh, Presbyterian Church, and she begins to educate young girls. And not just educate, but she starts to ransom young girls from being enslaved. She, uh, uh, She ransoms them from the slave trade, and she does it by trading goods that she has, so scissors and uh, cloth and other items. And soon, she ransoms between 40 to 50 young girls, and she doesn't just ransom them, but she takes her own salary. Again, African-American during this time, not a lot of money coming in, but she takes the income that she has, and she builds a home for these 40 to 50 young girls. And there she oversees their teaching. She uh, holds a church service for them every single day after breakfast. And they attend a missionary school, and the young girls are learning to read 
and to write. So she's not only telling them about Jesus, but she's also educating them and helping them to live a life of dignity and honor as image bearers of God. The home eventually became known as Pentops after a Presbyterian school in Virginia. And then Fearing eventually leaves the mission field after many years of service. Remember, she gets there at 56. She stays a long time. She finally comes off the field, and she attends a Presbyterian church in Selma, Dallas County. And she, once again, teaches a Sunday school in that church. Fearing would go on to uh, go home to be with the Lord on May 23rd, 1937. For our second and final missionary story, we do not have a picture of him because, as you'll see, he was uh, in a sensitive country. His name was Hakeem Scott, modern missionary. And he's proof that that God is raising up African Americans today to go to the mission field. It's not just in the past, but he's doing something within our own time. And uh, he was born in Detroit, Michigan, to Muslim parents. His father raised him to be a devout Muslim, but Hakeem saw himself as a Muslim in name only. He actually said that my heart was empty, which his Islamic faith could not fill. So as an adult, he came to faith in Christ due to the witness of his roommate uh, in the Air Force. He was stationed overseas, and while he was stationed overseas, he meets his wife. Three years later, he felt that God did not want him to re-enlist in the military. So he attends a Baptist Bible college in the States. And in college, he realizes that he has a heart for global missions. He's thinking constantly about those who don't yet know Christ overseas. So what does he do? He goes on his first short-term mission trip to Mexico City, And there he serves among the deaf population. He also, of course, considering his background as a Muslim, his heart is to reach other Muslims for Jesus Christ. And he had opportunities to do so, to share the gospel with Muslims uh, on different mission trips. And he went on mission trips to Albania and Ukraine. One day, a missionary comes to their home and he asks Hakim and his wife, Will you pray about going to China as a missionary? We need more missionaries in China. Will you go to China? And I love Hakeem's answer because he keeps it real. He goes, I'm black and there ain't no black people in China. And that's the same thing I would have thought too. Like, ah, bro, can can I go somewhere where there's some more people who look like me? But Hakeem says, you know what? I'm going to pray about it. Now, Christians, let's be honest. When someone asks you, why why are you laughing? You know, you you know why you, amen. Why are we laughing? Why? Because we know good and well when we don't want to do something, what's the first thing we say? I pray about it. That basically means no. Fellas, if you ask a woman out and she says, I, let me pray about it, she don't want to date you. She don't want to date you. Hey, count, cut your losses and move on. She don't want to date you, man. But Hakeem actually does it. He prays. And I'm going to be honest, when you pray to God about reaching people whom he loves for Christ you got to be careful because he will answer those prayers. What did Jesus say? Pray to the Lord of the harvest to, thrust, to, to, to raise up laborers, to thrust out laborers into his harvest field. If you pray, I give you my word. I give you Jesus' word. The Holy Spirit's like, listen, you may not want, I may not want you to go there, but I got some stuff for you to do. There are people I want you to reach. So he goes to China with his wife to check it out. And a year later... He and his wife leave to China to be missionaries. So Hakim worked alongside another missionary who was already established in China, but that missionary ended up having health problems. So the missionary leaves back to the States, which leaves Hakim and his wife as the leaders of that missions team and that missions uh, ministry over in China. His official status in China was a teacher. So this occupation really brought him into uh, contact with a lot of young Chinese students. And through his occupation, through his teaching, he begins to form these really close and deep relationships with these Chinese students. And from that friendship and that trust that was built, he's able to verbally share the gospel 
with these students. And Hakeem was also a risk taker for the Lord. He was involved in smuggling Bibles into China, a crime that is punishable by the government. And he was caught at least once. Thankfully, did not die, was not uh, in prison. We don't know uh, for a long period of time, but he was able to still continue to stay in China and minister there. Although his blackness, his ethnicity made him stand out, he actually said it was an advantage to him because it drew attention to this tall black man in China. So, of course, a lot of the Chinese people are saying, why are you here? We don't see a lot of African-Americans. So that draws more people, and through it, he's building even more relationships with the people. The good thing about this is that the Holy Spirit blessed his ministry, blessed the fact that he was a black missionary in China because he ends up leading, uh, leading 40 to 50 people to Christ and possibly more that we don't know of. Many of his uh, disciples, his, the, the ones he's discipling, they ended up becoming witnesses of Jesus Christ themselves. So with those two stories, the question then goes, why are black missionaries important? Why are they important? Well, they're important because so many worldwide desire, amen, desire to hear the good news of Christ from our lips. What do I mean by that? Some years ago, uh, again, the organization I work for is Mission to the World. It's the uh, sending organization for the Presbyterian Church in America, which I'm a part of. And there was a trip taken to uh, Australia by a bunch of African-American leaders and pastors, and they went to the Aboriginal people. Now, if you know anything about the Aboriginal people, they have a story that's very similar to African-Americans when it comes to how they were treated by the white citizens in that location, and sadly, from white Christians as well. Uh, they have been brutally mistreated. They're actually in a, even a worse state than African-Americans. It's horrendous and tragic how they still live in Australia because of their history. And uh, because of that, they have a hard time trusting white missionaries. If a, if a white missionary comes to them, they don't really have any trust with them. They don't want to speak to them. They don't want the missionaries to speak to them because we know what your ancestors, we know what white missionaries have done historically to our people, and we want nothing to do with you guys. However, when they saw a group of African Americans, of black people coming over, they were instantly uh, uh, welcoming, they were instantly trusting, because they know we have a similar history. And what they wanted to know is, why do y'all as African Americans, why do y'all Hold to the Bible. Why do you believe in a Jesus in whose name you were abused and mistreated? And they want to know, why do you still hold on to Christianity and this gospel? And the Holy Spirit opened the door for this group of black leaders and pastors to explain history, which we'll be talking more about today, about the history of Christianity in Africa over a thousand years before the transatlantic slave trade. They got to talk to them about why they hold to the true Jesus and the true Bible and that Christianity is really a religion of empowerment, not one of oppression. Amen. Who said that? Thank you, brother. Amen. So they got to share God's love in Christ with the Aboriginal people to the point that they wanted to know, when are you guys going to come back? When are you coming back over here to talk to us? Will you send more people to come back to talk to us? They loved it. They loved having a team of African-American missionaries over there because you're like us. We can relate to your story because it's our story in a lot of ways. In the motherland, which is Africa, a group of Africans asked, they says, we have, we, we have a lot of white missionaries coming over, but where are the African-Americans at? Literally asked our miss, missionaries, where are, our African, where are the African-American missionaries? How come they don't come over 
like the white missionaries do. And there are other people groups who want and welcome African-American missionaries because they want to know about the God who enables African-Americans to overcome their history of, of slavery and, and, and segregation and brutality. They want to hear it. How does Jesus speak into our situations? They want to know about this Jesus Christ, this Jesus of Nazareth, who cares so much about the oppressed, the poor, and the marginalized, that he became an oppressed, marginalized, and poor Jewish man in his incarnation under the brutal Roman Empire. Tell us about this Jesus who knows what it is to be looked upon as inferior because of his ethnic identity, because of the color of his skin. They want to know, and African Americans have a significant part to play in bringing the gospel of this brown-skinned man named Yeshua, who lived in Africa for a time. And they want to know, what does this Jesus have to say about us? What does Jesus say about the fact that there's this wealth gap? What does Jesus have to say about the fact that we are looked upon as the scum of the earth? What does he say? Does Jesus only care about taking me to heaven when I die? Or does he care about now? And the true Jesus does not just care about us going to heaven when he dies. Yes, that's a great thing. Amen. But he cares about now. He cares about what we go through now. African-Americans have the opportunity, have the, the, the significance. We have the, the blessing to take that gospel to those who yearned to know the true Jesus, not the Jesus that was crafted to justify oppression, but the true Jesus who delivered the Israelites out of slavery. Because if you read Exodus 3, it says that Moses was talking to God in the burning bush was the angel of the Lord. Who's the angel of the Lord? The pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. It's Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, who's leading the Israelites out of slavery. This is the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Let me get back on script. Love y'all. Pray for a brother. There is pain. There's purpose in our story. There is a purpose in our pain as black people in America. There is purpose in how we have overcome as a people because of our faith in Christ. So many people, so many young people are leaving Christianity because they think it's a religion of the oppressors. And what they don't realize is that Christianity is a religion of empowerment, that Christianity is a religion that our ancestors held on to, and it was their faith in Christ that enabled them to fight against unjust systems in a righteous, just way. This is the Jesus we get to share. So let's love God through loving our neighbors overseas by sharing with them the story of Jesus and our testimony, and watch what the Holy Spirit does with what our history is. If we're obedient, if we are obedient, God will use us as African-Americans and he'll use us as a wider church as well. And finally, black missionaries are important because a false version of Christianity has been used to harm image bearers of color in a variety of ways. And because of this reality, we kind of talked about it, Christianity is seen a lot of times as the white man's religion. African-American missionaries are an important and powerful antidote to that lie. What do I mean? Well, we have the blessing of educating our people worldwide that Christianity is not the white man's religion. We get to do that by saying that Christianity was in Africa before it even touched Europe. The Africans helped shape and form the Christian religion and Christian mind before it ever went to Europe. That, and this is over a thousand years before the transatlantic slave trade. We get to tell people that the Protestant reformers, especially Martin Luther, looked to the Ethiopian church 
and not just their example, but their doctrine. That the reformers, Calvin, Luther, stood on the shoulder of black men. So the Reformation is not just a white European event. It's a Jewish and African event as well. And we also get to tell them that some who were stolen from Africa were already Christians. So that this view that Christianity was beat into the slaves is historically not true. Black missionaries also show the world the truth of what evangelist Billy Graham once said. He, go, he says, Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. Christianity is a religion for everyone, not just one ethnic people, but for all people groups. What did God tell Abraham? Through you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Through your seed, Abraham, Jesus, every ethnic group will be blessed because of him. This is the good news. Black missionaries are a beautiful and shining example of God's continued faithfulness. So then you may be saying, all right, Anthony, cool. Why are there so few black missionaries then? And I don't know if you've noticed, but yeah, it's pretty bad. There's not a lot of black missionaries at all. As of 2020, the largest denomination in America has 3,700 long-term missionaries. And out of that number, go ahead and feel free to shout it out. How many of those missionaries, those 3,700, how many of those missionaries do you think are African-American? Nah, bruh. <laughs> a little bit more, a little bit more. Throw some numbers out. I, I want to hear. 100? 30, okay. 50? 13. As of 2020, only 13 of those 3,700 missionaries are African-American. Guys, that is 0.3%. And the majority of other Christian missions organizations, they don't fare too well either. And this is not me up here attacking any organization whatsoever. But it's just to show the sad state of affairs right now. It's to be honest with the, the facts that there is a noticeable lack of black missionaries globally. Now, of course, there are obstacles for black people to get on the field. And a lot of these obstacles are in the form of historical realities that have negatively contributed to this, uh, th this lack. Historical realities such as white Christian racism toward black Christians, let's keep it real. Historical realities such as slavery and Jim Crow segregation. Historical realities such as how racism, you ready? expressed itself in the legal and economic structures and systems of this nation, which has contributed to this day the horrendous wealth gap between white and black America. What, why does that matter? Because that is the reason why it is so difficult for black Christians to raise the support that they need to get onto the field. You cannot talk about the lack of black missionaries without talking about the racial wealth gap. There's no way. So when people want to skirt that issue, I say that is one of the main issues. We can't talk about this without talking about that. I can't tell you in my line of work how many black people I've talked to say, yeah, that's a lot of money I have to raise, and I can't blame them. Because a lot of African Americans do not have the network it takes to raise the support. When you got your grandma and you got people in the church sometimes struggling just to keep their light bills on. How do you feel asking them to support you financially? I know I wouldn't. No, you go pay your light bill. But then we have churches building these humongous mega churches while people overseas are dying and going to hell every day. Where are our priorities? Do we really care about the kingdom of God? Or do we care about making a platform and a kingdom and a name for ourselves? Can we just be honest today? 
We care more about bigger, better, greater than we do about souls that Christ loves going into judgment every single day without knowing the name of Christ. How dare we? How can we stand before Jesus of Nazareth on that last day? Look him in the eye. And then have to confess and have to say that I chose to put my money, my time, my energy into things that will that don't matter. They'll burn. But I didn't care enough about your kingdom. This is to all of us, guys. There is a mission out there. This is life and death. This ain't a game, baby. This ain't a game. People are dying every day and they will go to hell. Do we care? Do we care? Do we care? Do I care? Do you care? Y'all, do we care enough to do something about it? Do we love them? More importantly, do we love him enough? Do we love him enough to do something about it? Are we willing to sacrifice to see our brothers and sisters overseas come to know Jesus? Or are we content to live these comfortable Christian American lives? What will we say to him when he comes in his glory and we stand in front of his throne? What will we say to Jesus Christ? Because we will have to give an answer. We will have to give an answer. Another obstacle is the historical reality of colonialism and global missions. There's a famous quote uh, attributed to Desmond Tutu and uh, another gentleman named Jomo Kenyatta that illustrates this sad reality of colonialism. It says, when the missionaries came to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes. When we opened them, we had the Bible, but they had our land. There are many black Christians who are hesitant to engage in global missions because they don't want to engage in colonialism, and that's a good desire. But there are many examples of black Christians, which we just went over two today, that have done global missions in a non-colonial fashion. And listen, we have to be consistent. By that, I mean this. If we are going to throw out the baby with the bathwater, if we're going to say we don't want to do missions because of how it's been abused, then we better not engage in reading the Bible, going to church, or believing in Christianity, because all three have been corrupted and twisted at different points in history to justify demonic forms of evil. However, God has been faithful to our people. And because he's been faithful to our people, African-Americans have done a great job at nuance and discerning the truth. Here's what I mean. Frederick Douglass, an escaped African-American slave turned abolitionist, public speaker, and author. He wrote this in his uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. He said, between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. To be the friend of the one is to be the enemy of the other by necessity. He says, I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slaveholding, women whipping, cradle plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. In the same way, we should follow his lead by saying this, between the global missions of this land and the global missions of the Bible, I recognize the widest possible difference. To be the friend of one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the humble, loving, peaceable, pure, and non-colonial global missions of the Bible. I therefore hate the unloving, arrogant, violent, impure, and colonial global missions of this land. For black folks in this room, White folks, you too, but black folks specifically. Let's honor our ancestors by picking up and carrying forward the torch of biblical global missions that they held and that they've now passed on to us. Global missions is our history. We have a part to play both in the past, here in the present, 
and in the future as well. Let's go into another obstacle. Why should we go overseas? Let's just send money overseas to the national church, pastors and leaders. I mean, that's a better way to use our time and resources. I understand the question, but my director says something. He goes, money can't hold or play with children. Money can't build that face-to-face relationship with the saints overseas. We're a family. Face-to-face relationship is important. As the African people asked, where are the African Americans? Not where are they money. Where are they? This is a big one. Another obstacle that stops a lot of black people from going to missions. We have so many problems in America and in our communities. Why should we care and go overseas? Well, the first reason, Jesus told us to do it. <laughs> like that, that's it. Like my kids ask me, Dad, what I have to do is sometimes I'm just like, because I told you to, man. Just go do it. Sometimes I give answers, but other times, just go do it because I told you to do it. That should be enough. But thankfully, God gives us even more. In Matthew 28, 16 through 20, he tells us to make disciples as we're going about our lives. And he doesn't just mean here at home. He also means as we're going overseas as well. In Acts 1.8, he says that we will receive the Holy Spirit and his power in order to be his witnesses beginning in Jerusalem, which is our communities, our cities. And then he ends by saying to the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, Jesus is saying you need to have a both and vision. It's not either or. It's not just reach your community, but then neglect your brothers and sisters overseas. And it's not to go overseas, but neglect your community. He says you need to do a both and. Both and. Reach where you are and also cast your eyes to the nations as well. To neglect global missions is to dishonor Christ through our disobedience. And the last reason why we should care about missions and by going overseas is because of the glory of the triune God. We live for the glory of our triune God. Listen, when we realize what our God has done for us, from the Father electing us, choosing us in eternity past, to sending his Son to live, die, and rise again in our place to save us, and the Holy Spirit taking that redemption and applying it to us, how can we keep that good news to ourselves? Y'all, for those of you who are in a relationship married, do you remember how excited you felt when you got into that relationship? You couldn't help but to tell someone, right? Especially for us fellas who we always marry up, when you realize that that woman out of your league actually liked you, what did you do? Bruh, let me tell you about this date I got tonight. Bruh, she said yes. Bruh, she wants to go on a second date with me. You can't help but to be excited. You tell. You don't have, no one has to tell you to tell. Sometimes people are like, hey, all right, man, we know. We're happy for you. Chill out. Shouldn't we have a greater reaction to what Christ has done for us, though, where we can't help but to tell? Okay, I know this is disobedient. Forgive me, pastor. Forgive me, pastor. But I kind of, there's a one form of disobedience I actually kind of like in the Bible. It's when Jesus does something real good for someone, like heals them, and he says, listen, please don't go tell anyone. Just, just don't tell anyone. It's not time, man. They go, okay, okay. Hey, let me tell you about what Jesus did. And my kids are like, Dad, is that bad? I'm like, it's bad, but it's good at the same time, man. Like, if you're going to disobey Christ, this is the best way to disobey him. You know what I mean? Like, but I love that fact. They're like, I, okay, all right, I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to say nothing. And then later they're like, hey, and G, it's to the point where Jesus is like, okay, we can't stay here because we have more people coming now. Let's be that way. Let's fall so in love with our triune God that we can't help but to speak of him. So um, let me go ahead and close it up. Steps to seeing some more black missionaries on the field. First, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would raise up and send forth more black missionaries to the field. Second, if you know any black Christians who are interested in global missions, knowing what we know about how hard it is to raise support in the black community, Think about giving to them. Not everyone can. And this is not to put a law on anyone. Not everyone legitimately can give. That's okay. Pray for them. But if you can give, if you see that there's a way, maybe I, okay, maybe I don't need you to go to Starbucks every single week. 
Maybe I can give that to a black missionary. Do so. What does Jesus say? Where your, treasure, uh, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. What does our pocketbook say about where, what we treasure? Third, black people, we need to recover the history of our people in global missions. It is a lie from the pit of hell that we do not care about global missions. We do. We do. And we will continue to because we're a part of this story as much as our white brothers and sisters. A few things I want to show you, a few books for towards that end. I have three books here. I got it closed up so uh, Candace and Hannah don't beat me up. So I'm going to finish up real quick. But I got three books here. Come talk to your boy after. Come take a picture. Come take a look. These are three amazing books about African-American uh, presence within missions, and it teaches about it. Great books. Highly encourage them. And then lastly, I want to encourage all of you, black, white, Latino, Asian, everyone, go on one mission trip. God may not call every single person to go to the field, and that's fine, but we're all called to do something, whether we pray, we send, we go. Let me encourage you guys, one mission trip. I'm actually going to Israel, uh, Lord willing, in September for about nine days. If you are interested, we have a few more spots open. I would love to take anyone who wants to go to the Holy Land. Let's roll. We're going to Nazareth, Jerusalem, and Bethlehem. Roll with your boy. We'd love to have you. There's one more picture here. Uh, <laughs> I went on a mission trip to Central Asia, and it's a predominantly Islamic country, 99% Islamic. You wake up in the morning and you're hearing the Islamic call to prayer. You go to sleep at night and you're hearing the Islamic call to prayer. And it was such a good experience and we got to share the gospel with uh, the bus driver because he wants to know, what are all you Americans? And not in a bad way, but I've, you know, what are you Americans doing over here? And we got to share with him Christ and he was so interested that he was willing to continue the conversation with one of the national Christian leaders in that area. This picture here, though, as Hakeem noticed, like his blackness drew attention, so did mine. Uh, I'm getting ready to go out for the day, and these two gentlemen who worked at the hotel, or at least one of them did, uh, they look at me, and I kind of look at them, and I'm like, and they're just staring. So I'm like, did I offend them? Did I do something wrong? They go, Floyd Mayweather? I go, no, no, no. I'm I'm not, I'm not Floyd Mayweather. They go, Floyd Mayweather. I said, I'm not Floyd Mayweather. They go, can, you, can we take a picture? I said, but I'm not Floyd Mayweather. I'm not him. They go, can you do the pose, which is why we're doing the pose. I, but I'm not, and I don't think they understood. I'm like, I'm not Floyd Mayweather. They go, picture, take, do the pose. <laughs> I was like, all right, bro, listen. Lord, I tried. I tried. You know what I mean? All that to say, God will use you. So listen. Let's go out and tell people the best news ever. That there's a God in heaven who's reconciling all things through Jesus Christ by the power of his spirit. Not only reconciling all ethnic groups, all peoples to himself, but he's reconciling the entire creation as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for this time, Lord. We pray that you were glorified, that your son was exalted, and that Holy Spirit, we just pray that your work was done. In Jesus' name, amen.